Thank you, Pastor John. All right, let's give it up for the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, you see, Pastor announced me. I'm a licensed physical therapist, and I'm going to let you know more joints, anything with your tendons, ligaments, bones. While we're teaching, you see, I used to manipulate, put hot packs on people and put them into exercise programs. But by the Spirit tonight, just believe you're in a room where things are going to happen. And they will. All right? Let, they will. So let's just give, give it up to the Lord again. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you honor and praise, Father. You are the one enthroned tonight. You are the one we exalt. You are the one who receives all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. How many of you have built a sukkah? Well, Glenn and I, my husband, we decided to use uh, deck furniture and put our umbrella. We got a nice table on our deck. It has a base. And the table, the glass table, has a, a hole about this size. And, you know, we put the, the umbrella in there. So I found out when I, after uh, going to uh, coming, I was at church this morning, went home, come to find out that that umbrella that is about this high, it was, there was a wind, it literally came off its base, went through the opening, and landed on the roof. <laughs> and now my husband was very tall. I said, I, I said, honey, I know you're making this up. I know you miss me, you love me, you know. No, he said, Pascal, it was on the roof and it was upside down. So I don't know about you, but God is moving things, doing things, spiritually, naturally. The winds are blowing, and they are going to blow tonight. So you might as well just go ahead and get an umbrella or do something. Get in the rain, because it's, God is wanting to do a lot. And Pastor did say he is right. I like form. I like structure, but I love flow. The only reason I like structure and order is because it helps flow, operate, and move in the direction that it should. And so as a teacher tonight, as a minister tonight, I want to talk to you about the theme for tonight or today, which is about dwelling in the protection of God. We live in a time when, in a season, when fear is the dominant emotion, the dominant and prominent and, and seems permanent because every time you go, you listen to the news, you talk to people, they are expressing fear in its various forms. Whether it be worry, anxiety, depression, sadness, uncertainty, people are living in fear. And Psalm 23 verse 4, God in his word describes a shadow. He calls it the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. There are many shadows Fear is a shadow. Death is a shadow. And tonight, we're going to learn about a shadow that is not fear, a shadow that is not death, but it is the shadow under the wings of the Most High. And you get to choose which shadow you want to live under. That's the introduction. I want to also say these things to you. I was sitting there this morning in my journal I wrote this down for myself, but I felt like it was too good, you know. Sometimes you want to keep things secret, but I was like, too good to keep for myself. i got to share it with you. But this is what the Lord says in this season to you and to me. I have already considered all the options. I have already calculated all the risks. And you, my people, the conclusion from me is that all will be well. Let me say that again, and I want you to say it for yourself. Say, Father, Father you have considered all the options. You have calculated all the risks. And you have concluded, and you have concluded as, for as for me and my house, all is well, all is well. And, all and all will be well. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the protection of the Lord, but I have to begin with a personal testimony. Um, pastor shared that I was born in Haiti, and I want to share a, a testimony that I've actually never shared in public, not really, 
but the Lord gave me permission. And, and you'll understand why I haven't shared it in public because it's not the kind of thing that I'm comfortable sharing because it was a time in my life when I lived in fear and I lived under the shadow of fear. Me and my family, we suffered under the torment of fear. So I know something about fear and I know what I'm going to be talking about personally and also from the word of God. When I was born, I was born under, in Haiti, but I was born under the uh, leadership of a dictator, an evil, wicked dictator called Papa Doc. And in the 1960s, my father realized that he did not want to stay. It was not safe and it was not a good idea to stay in a country and raise his family. So he went through, through various means, paid money to try to get a visa legally. See, when you come from certain countries, you got to say that to come to the United States. And in order to get the visa approved, you had to get to Papa Doc's desk. And through various means, by the grace of God, he was able to get someone to secretly get a stamp of approval for him to come to the United States in the 1960s. But sometime in April of 1963, something very unexpected happened in Haiti. Papa Doc's children, while they were going to school, someone shot the uh, bodyguard as well as the chauffeur and they were shooting and trying to aim for his, his children. Well, this evil, weak, wicked dictator just lost his mind. He began to kill anybody and anyone he thought might be responsible for shooting and trying to kill his children. And my father's cousin was in the military, and he was a, a sharpshooter, and he had just come back from Panama and won medals for um, winning at shooting with the gun. He was in the military, he was very good. And he blamed my father's cousin, and so they went looking for him like a bat out of hell. And they targeted him, he was out, he found, you know, in Haiti they had the extended family, so what they did is they, he wasn't home, didn't matter. They killed my aunt, they killed my uncle, they burned them alive, they killed everybody in the house, and they were looking for him, and that dictator decided to give permission to kill whoever anybody connected to that family and anybody else you don't like. It was a crazy time in Haiti, and that occurred in April of 1963. Things were so bad in Haiti that President Kennedy decided that it was unsafe for any commercial planes to fly in and out of Haiti, so he suspended all flights. Well, it just so happened that my father through, had his visa was going to expire on May 18, 1963, three weeks before this happened. They basically said, you know what, there's no way out of the country and we don't know if there'll ever be a plane that will leave to come to the United States. Well, for some, some unusual reason, we don't know, the grace of God. So when I tell you about fear and they were hunting us down, we had to go into hiding. I was raised to keep my mouth shut, didn't, don't talk to people, don't answer questions, because if you, you were always going to be at risk of getting killed, stolen, shot, who knows, and all kinds of things. And there are more details, gory details, which I won't share with you. But the point is, we needed to get out fast. My father needed to get out of the country as fast as possible. No planes, nobody can get in and out of Haiti. But somebody got hold of my father on May 17th and said, I don't know, but I heard that there is a delegate, there is a plane call from the League of Nations flying in on May 18th. Now, we don't know. They're coming from the United States. They're coming because they want to establish peace here in Haiti because there's so much bloodshed and there's so much chaos. Well, I want you to know on May 18th, one plane flew into Haiti and three Haitians left that day, and my father was one of them. And so God, in his wisdom, and if my father hadn't left on May 18th, his visa would have expired, that plane had to come. So when I tell you God can deliver you, God can make a way for you, I know personally what it's like. And I can tell you, and I will share some more things, some other details, but the point I'm trying to say is I know what fear is like. I know the power of it. I know what it will do for you. I know what it, what it means to not just pass through the shadow, but live in it, swim in it, eat in it, talk about it day and night. And we live in a time right now because of the pandemic. It's been a year and a half. And I guarantee you that there isn't, you know, if you watch any media or any news, I mean, they talk about death, who died, how many died. They're predicting who will die. Talking about death has become the norm for us because of the pandemic. But we as believers, we have to be able to choose what we're going to talk about and which shadow we're going to live under. Yes. 
We will walk through the shadow of the valley of death, but we are not going to stay in it. We're not going to live in it. We're not going to let it talk to us. We're passing through. And so passing through is what I want to talk to you about. Because you see, living with God, I had to learn this. I didn't like it. But living with God and walking with God is not just a journey. It's not a walk, a little picnic walk. It is an adventure. And if you look up, I want you to go back later, look up the word adventure. Adventure is something that is, yes, exciting, but dangerous. It means there are risks, hazards. It's unusual. You don't know what's going to happen. You live with uncertainty. That's what an adventure is. It's exciting, all right, but it has these risks. And God loves adventure. So when you, when God promises us safety, and we're going to read Psalm 91, we're going to read specific verses, or to deliver us, or to save us, it's in the middle of an adventure. And safety is not the exemption of enemies. Safety is not the exemption of difficulties or challenges. Safety is when all hell is breaking loose and the enemies are targeting you to shoot you down. God says, I got you. It will all be well. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> I just want you to get rid of the enemies. But let's turn to Psalm 91. I want to, I want to look specifically at some verses with you because we're going to draw some conclusions, some points about this verse. You know, shadows are found throughout the Bible. Psalm 23, verse 4 is one of them. And if you look at Acts, I believe it's chapter 5. How many of you know about Peter's shadow? Yeah. That was a good shadow. How many of you want to be under Peter's shadow? <laughs> we know Peter's no longer with us, but we can have... Reproduction, we can have the same anointing. Somebody can have a shadow. But you know what? The one thing about a shadow, you got to be close if you're going to experience what that shadow has to offer, right? In Psalm 91, let's take a look because that's our theme verse for today. And I know that many people have spoken about it and talked about it this morning during prayer, this morning to, when, during the teachings for Joel and, and Kevin Remy. It was amazing. Pastor Harry, and even in the uh, transition today, Pastor Ken talked about it. I want to still have us read it again. <laughs> Key verses, okay? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Now, this conference is called Dwell. Let me give you, an, an, you know, many definitions of dwell. Dwell is a habitation and not a visitation. Because a lot of people love to visit the things of God but they don't want to live in it. Who are you? Habitation. It needs to be a habit. This is where I live. This is, I cannot live apart from being in the presence of God. But there are a lot of people that visit. Visitation is not habitation. Dwell means I have decided this is my dwelling place. And it, the Lord is saying in that verse, so before we go any further, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. God has some secrets. And he's got some places where only he can hide you, shelter you, cover you. You know, I'm thinking about this verse, and I know it's not connected necessarily to this verse, but I remember the Lord just kept talking to me about today. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but not to others. It is hidden from them. And so when you spend time with God, he will reveal to you the secrets of the kingdom, the keys, how to get things done. See, a lot of us are working hard. I mean, you know, you don't want to work harder. You want to work smarter. You want to work smarter. You want to work under the blessing of God and not under the curse of the enemy. So he who dwells, habitates, lives in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. God, the bird metaphor in the Bible is very significant. God loves to use metaphors and illustrations to describe characteristics of himself or actions that he loves you to remember. And the bird metaphor is a very significant metaphor in the Bible. 
And I remember just spending some time with the Lord, you know, where even in the book of Genesis, it says the Holy Spirit was hovering yeah. over chaos, the absence of life, over the waters, hovering. Now, I've got my little, you know, bird feeders, and I've got my little, you know, <laughs> Glenn, do not laugh. Uh, listen, I, I, listen, in the winter in Syracuse, I like to, I mean, I see blue jays, I see life, I see birds, I love it, cardinals and all. So, but during the summer, I have a hummingbird feeder. How many of you have, have hummingbird? All it is is water and sugar, baby, nectar, and they come. And that's all, I just, and they hover. And it's like they're holding spill. And I mean, I mean, they are just amazing to me. I just could stare at them all day. But the bird metaphor always happens right when God is about to do something new and different. And so the Spirit of God is hovering. The, the bird metaphor shows up again in the time of Noah, after the flood. Noah sends out a one bird, comes back to him. He finally he sends out a dove, which eventually comes back, and then he sends it out again. Another bird metaphor, again, over the face of water. And then we find Jesus in the Jordan. We got more water. Something new is about to happen. And the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove and settles, remains on him. And so this whole idea of bird, God loves birds, I guess. But he had the idea, you know, and I was thinking when I was reading this this week, I was thinking about the, you know, eagles. I love eagles. And eagles have wings that can span anywhere from six to eight feet on average. Six to eight feet from one end to the other. Could you imagine? And we are talking about the almighty under the shadow of the almighty. And we're going to find out in Psalm 91 that God wants you to remember that he's got feathers like a bird. And he wants you to come under his wings. So God is telling us, I have a space, I have a place for you that you need to come under. It's under a shadow. There are a lot of shadows, but this is a shadow you're going to have to choose. And then, of course, he goes on to say what you will do. That's what he has. But here's how you come and experience this beautiful presence of God and protection of God. There are things you need to say about God. There are things you need to say about God to yourself. There are things you need to say God to others. There are things you need to say God to the enemy. I will say of the Lord, about the Lord. I will say to the Lord. I will say of the Lord to myself. What are you going to say of the Lord? You are my fortress. You are my refuge. You are my deliverer. You are my strength. We have to come up with a whole list. And some of you need to create lists of words because you don't, when you get into a tough spot, you don't know what to say. You're looking for someone to help you. You need to learn. You need to grow up. In a time of dwelling, God wants you to swim in the deep end. You don't want to put your tippy toe in the little kiddie pool and say, oh, I got wet today. Let's learn to jump in the deep end. Come on, come on. There's a lot of water in the kingdom. Let's get wet, saturated, soaking wet. Here's what God says. Let's keep reading. Okay, I will say of the Lord. And then verse 3. Let me, let me, let's read verse 3. And then I love this word, surely. How many of you like that word? Surely. How, you know what? How confident are you that God will deliver you? Surely he will, right? Confident, certainty, assurance of heart. So when you're saying all these things, you see, there's a lot of people that are like parrots. They can say all the right things, but they don't believe it right. in their hearts. Right. See, you can't fake it, right. at least not in the kingdom. You can fool me, but you can't fool the enemy. Right. You can't fool God. See, I can tell you how to say all the right things, but do you believe it in your heart? Faith believes God. So that you have to be like Abraham, being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he is able to fulfill it. And so that's what it's saying. So when you say, I will trust in the Lord, because surely he will find a way to deliver me. He shall, it says, deliver you. Deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. We are living in verse 3 now. Right now. 
A snare is a trap. And I'm letting you know, sadly, there are a lot of Christians that are going after the, going right into a trap. All you have to do is put the little sweet thing in front of them and they believe the lie. You see, you don't enter a snare unless something is attracting you. And some of you are attracted to the wrong thing. Do you know why? You're not taking the time to discern. Don't be fooled by what it looks like on the outside. Find out what's happening on the inside. We need to be wise. This is a season where we need wisdom. And wisdom takes the time to discern. To discern means to distinguish. This is good. This is okay. This is better. This is bad. This is going to get me into trouble. See, we are children. Everything looks good. To children, everything shiny looks good. But this is a time where we really need to pay attention to what God is telling us so that we can be more discerning. But he says, surely he shall deliver you. Now, I have to be honest with you. I love Pastor John for many reasons. Pastor John, I love you for many reasons. He's a good-looking guy. He's married to Pastor Lisa. Okay, It's good to have a good-looking pastor. Is that okay to say that, Pastor Lisa? Come on now. (laughs) And he's smart and he's intelligent. And yes, he has strengths and weaknesses. <laughs> there is no one who does it. But what I, I love as a teacher to uh, just talk about the Bible and the Word with somebody I, you know, I can go, at, go and talk about. So we were talking about this word deliver. And so Pastor John says, okay, wait a second. I said, I said Pastor John, you know, deliver is found a couple more times, several times in, in Psalm 91. I think it's two. He says, no, there's three. So it's like, okay, let's look at the Hebrew. So we were like looking at that. And so I'm like, I'm going to share with you what we both came together and discovered together, you know, about this word. This word deliver means that he is going to, t- uh, to rescue you out of a trap because you are stuck. So this first word, deliver, in the Hebrew has to do with rescue. You're already, you're, he's going to deliver you from, notice, the snare of the fowler. Many of you are stuck and you can't get out, and you're going to need God to rescue you. But notice that he's not only going to deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. COVID-19, COVID, whatever, all the COVIDs, all the whatever. Name it, rename it, add to it, is a plague and is a perilous pestilence. And some people have had it. You know, I'm happy to say, I'm happy to say it online, that at Abundant Life for the last year and a half, and we praise the Lord for that, no member of Abundant Life has passed away from COVID. They've always recovered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you may experience it, you may get it, you you may get caught in it, but you will be delivered. Claim if you have family or you yourself are having symptoms, you need to go right to verse 3 and say, surely, surely. You got to start with the surely. He has and he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Hallelujah. I want us to go to verse, jump down to verse uh, 14 and 15 because I want you to look at the other two delivers. There are two other words that are used, and all three are three different Hebrew words. Thank you, Pastor John. You did the work. <laughs> all right. I mean, I knew at least they were, def- they were there, but we just kept talking, and it was just like wonderful. So check this out. Verse 14. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. That's a different word. That means that, means, uh, that word actually has to do with cult, uh, an escape. Total escape in the Hebrew. Again, some of you can go study that further. In other words, in other words, you will be able to go right past it, and you will it will not hurt you. Nothing will come your way. You will have an escape. You will be taken out. So the, there are dangers that you can avoid. There are dangers that God will cause you to not experience. So the first one, you're caught. You 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 fell into the trap. And God delivered you and can and will. The second one, you're about to go in it, but something happened. How many of you know in 9-11, there were many people who were going to work, but for some reason they had to check in here, something like don't go to work. Don't take the subway. 
You see, the absence of peace and the presence of peace are tangible things we need to know about God. And if you follow the leadings of the Lord, you, he will make way, a way of escape for you. He will make a way of escape for you. And he will protect you. Uh, I'll give you a person, an example. I grew up in New York City, and I remember I was going to college, St. Francis College, as a matter of fact, that particular day. And, you know, we have to exchange. You know, in New York City, you got to, I mean, you got to be on time. You know, the trains come at a certain time, and you know the connection. You got to get off the platform to make sure that other train comes so you can get there for that 8 o'clock class. And it took me two hours to go to get from where I live to St. Francis College for my 8 a.m. classes. So to make a long story short, I was uh, on the train, I was taking the F train, and all of a sudden I'm about to, oh, I'm like, oh, I'm, I was feeling excited because right on the other side of the platform was the exchange. I was gonna take the next train, and all the doors shut. I'm the only one that had to, to leave the train, and all the doors didn't open. Now, everybody else's doors open except mine. And I knew that day, God, you're protecting me. I'm gonna be late for class, but you protected me. An escape. So in other words, God will not allow you or the enemy to touch you. That's the kind of deliverance we're talking about over here. But guess what? There's more. There's more. There's another word. I mean, there is so much in, in Psalm 90, 91. I can just share on and on. But let's just talk about the delivering power of God. So notice it's because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him and I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, I will answer him, I will be with him in trouble. I will be, Lord, can't you say I will deliver him and never let him have trouble? No, it says I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. That word deliver is a whole different Hebrew word. Now, are you ready for this one? Because that's the one we're going to land on right here for the rest of our time. I will equip you to fight. Chris, I'm seeing you. Give me a high five in this. Ooh. We are not, ex you are not exempt. You are going into battle. But I have equipped you to fight. If you're like David, Goliath's coming at you. You're like, you got your stone in your sling. What else do you need? You are equipped for whatever is going on. And many of us, and this is where I want to just spend the, the rest of our time. I know time is, is ticking away. But this is where, as a Christian, as a person who lived in fear and intimidation, when, when the Lord says, but I've, I've equipped you, you can overcome. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I'm like, Lord, I don't want any weapons formed against me. I just want to go into hiding and have nothing. Just, just let it all go away. Surely I must, you know, people in faith, you know, and, I, and, I was, and it's a faith error to believe that you're not going to fight. Because one of the scriptures about faith is fight the good fight of faith. There is a fight. And I'm going to let you know there's some of you who are like leaning over, hoping something's going to happen, and you're losing. Because that scripture tells us that there is a delivering power from God which will require you to take action, yes. to take some action. And so that, I want to talk to you about what are the things that God provides? What are some of the things that God has given us in order to cause us to win? I, can, I don't even have to look at my notes. I'm just going to tell you how it works. The first is the word of God. God's word is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we have to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always in the spirit, all kinds of prayer. Our mouth, our tongue is a weapon. Say, my tongue is a weapon. Yes, your tongue is able to do all kinds of stuff. Do you know that your heart, how many of you know that your heart's been beating ever since you've been in your mother's womb? Do you know that that muscle doesn't get tired? Your heart muscle doesn't get tired? Do you know you've got muscles in your tongue, got eight muscles? They don't get tired either. <laughs> you can talk all day long. Your mouth muscles, but your tongue, tongue muscles don't get tired. When did your tongue ever say, you know, I'm tired? It was meant to be moved. And there's a skill and an accuracy and a way that we're supposed to talk because words matter. It is a secret of the kingdom of God, knowing what to say, when to say, when to be silent, when to shout. That requires the discerning power of God. Words matter. And the enemy hates the word of God. 
Jesus is our example. Remember in the wilderness when the enemy tried to tempt him to cause him to try to take a shortcut or eat something or do something against the will or the timing of God? It is written. So how many of you know it is written? Are you the kind of person, well, I don't know. I know it's written somewhere, but I'm really not sure. Help me. No, we have to get the word of God inside of us. So on the day of battle, we're equipped already beforehand to shoot, shoot to kill, so to speak. This is not the time to say, I'm not sure where the weapons are. I'm not sure what am I supposed to say. We're not prepared. And so part of the delivering power of God is cooperating with the Holy Spirit to do what is required in the moment. And not just waiting and hoping that something good will happen and just all the time. Yes, sometimes, but there are times there are things are required of you or they will not happen. They will not happen. So I want you to realize that your mouth, and I could say a whole lot, but if you're taking notes, if you could listen to the remings this morning, the teaching, they demonstrated how it ought to be done, how to pray the word, how to speak the word, how to declare the word, how to sing the word. Let's think of another one. I'm going to think, look, this is another thing that God has given us. I'm talking about against the enemy. I'm talking about specifically for protection, the word of God, the word of God. The Lord is telling me I need to give you scriptures because I can't trust you. Okay, Lord, you can't trust them, so I'm going to, yeah, you know, teachers have to make sure. I'd give you a test if we were in my class, but, okay. Remember I said safety is not exemption from enemies or the threats of enemies. So when I talk about scriptures against the enemy when you're equipped, these, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Isaiah 59, 19. This is what you say. When the enemy comes in, See, I like to say it a little bit different than where the common, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Now, you could say it the other way, when the enemy comes in like a flood. But you know, I don't know about you, but in the days of Noah, there was a flood. And you know what? The flood came from God. When the Israelites in the book of Exodus left Egypt, there was a flood that destroyed the enemy. So I like to say, when the enemy comes in, gets in the water, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him like a flood. So I like to just say it a different way. But I'm letting you know, he is going to try to come in. But the Holy Spirit will raise up a standard. So you've got to say that. You're not saying, oh, Holy Spirit, just spare me, spare me, spare me. Oh, Lord, don't let the enemy come. The enemy is here. And believe me, I get it because I was raised in fear. I was afraid of the enemy, afraid of the devil, afraid of everything. Oh, God, please, didn't talk, don't talk to me. I really, just the fact that I'm even standing here talking to you is a miracle. My brothers are watching in Florida. Hi, brothers and sisters. Uh, they know I was the little quiet one, well-mannered, don't talk, to, please, because I don't want to get in trouble. And now I'm telling you, can I just say this to you? I'm going to say it in the camera. I'm going to say it to you. I said, Lord, why did you raise up a little Haitian girl? I, haven't, I don't have a uh, degree in theology, and you have taught me the ways of God and the ways of the Spirit. Amen. Why would you do that? He said, because what the enemy meant for evil. I'm going to turn it around for good. Because in Haiti, people are very trained in the ways of the wicked one. And I'm about to do the opposite. I'm trying to train everybody I know in the ways of God, the Word, and the Spirit, which is greater than anything that the devil puts out there. I am not afraid of the devil. I'm trying to tell everybody how to defeat them, if they would listen. <laughs> no weapon forged against you will prevail. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And then it says, every tongue that rises up in judgment against you, you have to condemn. Now, you see, a weapon that is formed against you are words. The enemy also forges words, forms words. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wake up and I feel like words have been spoken. Words from the past have been authorized. Words from the government, words from leadership, words from people who don't, tr who don't like me. I have to deactivate those words. In the name of Jesus, every word, this is what you say, every word, Right now, that is risen up against me, I condemn it. But you have to do that. You have to condemn it. You can't just say, oh, well, they spoke about me. No. You got to pull it down. 
say, I refuse to have it come to life. I refuse to have it touch my life. Any word that doesn't agree with you, God, you are the highest authority in my life. Any authority that has spoken against me that doesn't agree with what you have said, I condemn those words because they disagree with you. So you got to just start, start talking like that. That's how it works. I'm trying to explain to you how it works. See, I can teach it and you not do it. Don't be a hearer of the word, but be a doer. You've got to take action. Your tongue and your mouth is a weapon. The second thing is the blood of Jesus. Oh, can I, listen, we've got to talk to people about the blood. People don't want to talk about the blood. Do you know blood is found from Genesis to Revelation? You shall overcome them by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. Blood had to be poured, blood had to be shed seven places, my God, to cleanse the temple, to cleanse the people. I mean, if you go back and you read the Old Testament, they were throwing blood on the people, not just on the mercy seat. Go read, there's some passages. Go find out where the blood was thrown. Even the book of Hebrews chapter 9, they had to sprinkle. There is cleansing and power in the blood of Jesus. It's one of the things the church doesn't teach enough on. And it's not just talking about the blood. Let's sing about the blood. We've got to apply the blood. What does that mean? That means you activate it. That means you claim its benefit with your mouth. You say, Father, I thank you that the blood of Jesus is on the mercy seat in heaven. He shed his blood. That blood that was, that was shed 2,000 years ago is still speaking today, according to the book of Hebrews. And I call it to witness against the enemy. In my favor, I put it a witness. I claim and plead what the blood is saying about me right now. Oh, no, devil, you can't. You see, my name, Pascal, is French, Pascal. In, in the Catholic Church, they call it the Paschal Lamb. In Greek, Paschal, Pasquale. It means Passover. And I want you to know, I apply that blood. Let me tell you one thing that happens when you say Passover, the Passover of the blood. The angel of death has to pass over your house, but you apply the blood. It can't be like, well, you know, it's in the house. We sang a song. You got to say, in the name of Jesus, Father, I thank you that the blood of Jesus speaks and my house is covered. I apply and I claim all the benefits of the blood of Jesus. And I thank you right now, devil, you cannot enter my home. Whatever plans you have, you will have to pass over. You will have to pass over. Say, pass over me. Pass over me. Can't do it unless there's blood. And the Bible says in the book of Exodus that the angel of death had to see the blood. It wasn't like, well, we talked about it. I got to see it. Can the enemy see the blood over you? It's in the spirit. Do you believe in the blood? Apply the blood. Another, a third, I'm giving you application. If you're taking notes, hey, you know, any of those things will work all by themselves, but I don't know about you, but I like to combine them all. <laughs> the third one is music. And it's interesting that Pastor John talked, you know, that was, we were talking yes, yesterday, you know, yesterday, last night, he, he said some things, and I'm like, oh, Pastor, I'm going to talk about that. Yes, hallelujah, yes. So, so he talked about string instruments, because you see, the devil hates praise and worship. Let me tell you. Now, listen to me for a moment, because remember, I'm a little Haitian girl, and I'm going to tell you about the enemy. <laughs> you see, the devil can sit in church and hear the word. He uses the word, calculates how to use it against you, twists it. But when you move into authentic praise and worship, he has to leave the room. He has to back up. Oh. It does something to him that he can't. He can't go there with you. He can start quoting scripture with you. He can dance with you. He can eat with you. He can do all kinds of stuff with you. But when you get into authentic, notice I said authentic. That means when the heart and the mouth are connected. Because Jesus did say, my people honor me with their, with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. See, it's a heart-mouth connection. So when it's pure... See, the devil can tell when you're faking it. You can't just throw weapons at him and say, Ooh. just put a cross and say, well, here's a cross. Do you believe it? 
So I want you to know praise, authentic praise and worship torment the devil. So you just need to turn it up. Put on, find some praise and worship music and go for it. Sing it. Talk about it. Make a melody in your heart. Make a joyful noise. I know you may not want to be in the praise and worship. Dion, please, these people will try to get rehearsal. Do not take any of them, including me. But you know what? In the spirit, your voice is beautiful to God. Your voice is beautiful to God. Sing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Sing aloud, shout, sing, sing. And the devil hates it because, you see, the devil in heaven, many people believe that he was the chief praise and worship leader who was over the glory. He was a cherubim. And so you have taken his job away from him. <laughs> Woo! Take his, just remind him, you know, it could have been you. <laughs> now let me show you how it's done. Got to have attitude. Yeah. Got to have attitude. If you're going to be delivered and you're going to claim the promises of God, you got to have attitude. You cannot play with the devil. Music. Just for, for those of you who want scripture to back it up, you know, in the Old Testament, it talked about how Saul was being tormented and they had to get a little sheep who played the harp, David. And it says, as he played, the tormenting spirit would leave. In the book of 2 Chronicles, I believe it's 2, where Jehoshaphat, we're going to, we got, he says, you know what? We, we're going to lose this battle, Lord, unless you do something. And then all of a sudden they get a strategy. Hey, you know what? We're going to say, we're going to bring the praise and worship people in front. We're going to go fight. God says, let me do my, let me do the fighting for you. Just do the singing. Yes. When we do the singing, the praise and worship, I'm telling you, enemies are defeated. Yes. The church needs to, I love what's happening. The anointing of God is powerful. And you need to be singing not just when Dion is leading. You need to be singing at home in the shower. You need to be singing in the car. You need to be making melody in your hearts while you're cooking. Make a melody in your heart to the Lord. The devil is listening and he hates it. And then last but not least, oh my God, I could say much more, is the last thing is power. You have to defeat the enemy with supernatural power. And Jesus said, Woo, glory to God. Acts 1, verse 8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. See, we, can't, we cannot do it with human power. We've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. You see, the Holy Spirit is in you if you're born again, but you need to release power, rivers of living water. Because in this time, we're living in the last days, and God said in this word, I will pour out my spirit in the last days upon my sons and my daughters. They shall prophesy, they shall dream dreams, all kinds of things, but there will be an evidence of power through your mouth. Again, we're going back to the mouth. Speaking in tongues is a powerful weapon against the enemy. There's a, a particular a man that I, I was reading uh, about, and he said, he was speaking in tongues, and he was kind of like thinking, oh, this feels stupid, foolish, I'm saying the same thing, Lord. And the Lord gave him, a, all of a sudden the Lord gave him a vision. He says, do not dishonor the holy things of God. And so he had a picture, and all of a sudden he saw two demons that were, look, that were in the room. And so, and so he said, keep speaking in tongues. So as he started speaking in tongues, he heard these demons. He said, do you feel that heat? When this guy does that funny, stupid language stuff, man, yeah, I feel a burning. And so it's not the two minutes of speaking in tongues that does the job. Put in the time. Because what happened is that as he began to speak in tongues, those demons felt the burning power of, of what was going on out of his mouth because you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you will have fire coming out of your mouth. <laughs> Woo! Baptism of fire. Yes, it can mean all kinds of things, but I believe the tongue, they saw, they saw fire and it landed. They saw flames and it landed on each one of them and remained. And they began to speak in other tongues. Acts chapter 2. There's fire in your mouth. James 3, the tongue is a fire. Set the fire. Burn the enemy. <laughs> Make him afraid of you. Okay, I've got to give you a couple of testimonies, and then we're going to pray for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We cannot let you go without power. 
These are real stories. So this is something that happened. Again, I haven't shared it publicly, but it happened. I had called my daughter who lives in San Diego now, and I said, "Honey, do you remember that day? But, you know, I live in, near uh, Jamesville, DeWitt area, and um, we were uh, on a winter day. We were uh, driving, I was driving, and it was evening. And I remember it was very, very icy. And again, those of you watching, you know, in, New York, in Syracuse, central New York, we get pretty uh, awful winters, very cold and icy. And I, I, I could tell, you know, was very careful, go slow as, you know, as slow as I can. But I knew there was a tractor trailer behind me and there was a car in the other lane. Well, for whatever reason, I couldn't turn to get off my exit. And so I ended up, I don't know, getting stuck right, the, right near the exit, and I couldn't back up, and I knew. And I said to myself, and it was dark, and I remember that moment. I said to myself, and I looked at my daughter who was next to me, and I reached out for her, and I knew I was gonna get hit, and I was gonna die or something. It was gonna be traumatic. And then all of a sudden, I just knew it. In a moment in time, I just hugged her and I said, I, we, I, gotta, I gotta brace her, prepare for, for something bad. Well, I, I did this, I, I kind of like, you know, prepared myself, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, I don't hear anything. All of a sudden, there was a dead silence. I look around, there is no tractor trailer. <laughs> no cars, nothing in front, nothing behind for a good five minutes until I got out and got into the exit. What do I believe happened? I don't know, but I don't care if I became invisible and they went through me or they got relocated them, but I'm letting you know that they disappeared. And God spared my life. I told Mika, so when she gets upset, I said, honey, don't remember God has a destiny for you. He kept us alive for a reason. He kept us alive. Don't complain. So I want you to know whether it's small or big, God will deliver you. He will protect you. He loves you. You are his people called by his name. He has considered all the options, calculated all the risk in this season of time that you're living in, and he has concluded that all is well with you. So start saying that all is well. Why don't you stand to your feet for a moment? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Pastor John, you know me. I know he did say you know, I said we, have, we always have a lot. He's right. That's one of the weaknesses. And, and I just blame Pastor John because I got everything I know from him. So <laughs> I got to turn, I got to learn how to turn it off and kind of whatever. Okay. I got to read this one scripture. Okay? It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is what Paul said to the Corinthian church. Verses actually 1 to 5. And I, brethren, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God wants you to not be weak Christians. He doesn't want you to worry, fear, cower, be dismayed by what's going on in the world. God always has a plan for his people to deliver them and to protect them. And if you are called by his name, you qualify. But there is power in speaking in tongues. This is something that is only for the last day church. I will pour out my spirit in the last days and they will speak in tongues. The evidence of the power of the spirit of God. So here I'm going to do something because I'm a teacher and I like to set people up. You ready? I know if you're like, oh, I don't want to do. Everybody who speaks in tongues, sit down. Everybody who speaks in tongues, sit down. That means stand up if you don't. Woo. Don't be embarrassed. It's okay. We're not gonna force you where it's an invitation. I'm not gonna have you come forward, but I'm gonna ask you if you want that power, you can have it tonight. You have to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but if you want power, supernatural power in your life, 
We're just going to have you say a prayer. I'm not going to, if you feel like, mm, yeah, I'm not good. Don't, don't worry about it. I'm not going to pinpoint any of you. But all of the rest of you are supporters, right? You're not just kind of like speculating, like, oh. You get to charge up the atmosphere so they can hear the roar of heaven in your mouth. So I'm going to have you just say a prayer with me, make a declaration, and then we're just going to go ahead and just begin to speak in tongues. I began to speak in tongues at 13 years old as a Catholic girl at a prayer meeting at St. Matthew's. All of a sudden, somebody said, what's that, what's that funny thing you all did? Can I have that? And it happened to be Cornelius who was doing the little group thing. He said, oh, you want to speak in tongues? And about 50 of us stood up. Yeah, why do we want that. Didn't even have any theology or anything about that. 13 years old. He says, well, let's just pray. And let's go ahead and invite the Holy Spirit. And about five minutes of just kind of like just going at it, all of a sudden a river began to flow. So the one thing you're going to have to do, you notice how I talked about your mouth, how your tongue, how important it is? You're just releasing that to the Lord. And out of your inner being shall flow rivers of water. You have the capacity to speak, yes, in your known language, but also in the power of the Spirit of God as he gives you utterance, sounds. Release the sounds that the Holy Spirit gives you. So everybody, just close your eyes. Father, we just praise you and thank you. For those of you who are standing, now this is what you need to say. Heavenly Father, I want the power of the Holy Spirit released in my mouth. The presence of God is in me. I am born again, but I want a flow of power in my life so that I can praise you, so that I can worship you, so that I can utter words that changes things. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me this amazing gift of speaking in other tongues in Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to have everybody begin to speak in tongues. Those of you who are standing, we're not going to have you come forward at this time, but let's begin to speak in tongues. Begin, because I know some of you, okay, so as you begin to open your mouth, to sumbo shi kalambro, sika tuti tuambari to si koropeshen dere posi para. There you go. She's got it. I can tell. Pasinta, you got to open your mouth. If you keep your mouth shut, you're not giving. You're not giving him the ability to give you the utterance. Se posinta la preshi kata, so porom preshi. Sia, sia, kento rose. Ah, hasi koram preshi te no si kotam breto marasita. O si cara breto para preso para shenda la bacara brote cara cintoro brate. Chumba, eto si, yes, yes, I see that. Go ahead, keep going. Tesora brisha, I know, I desa tomba la teca sendo. Pira preso barato roshika. Pero, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ito to, yes, you got it, you've got it, you've got it. Over here, over here. Te shonda la presota. I'm bold to come. I'm bold to come. Also, open the mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. For those of you who already speak in tongues, open your mouth louder. Louder. Wider. Release. Release. Release the utterance. As the Spirit gives you utterance. Now, you see, you can control it. You can control it. For those of you, oh, yeah, you're saying, hey, what about me online? Hey, I can tell. Hey, you qualify. You are doing, I can, t- I can just see somebody. I see a man, and you're jumping up and down right now. You're like, oh, my God, I can do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. You're honoring and praising the Lord. Okay, now I want everybody to just be quiet because it's control. You can decide when you do this. And I'm going to have everybody sit down. Those of you who are standing, you may sit down. And I think I'm going to do, Pastor John, I think because of time, I'm going to invite you to come up. I was going to have people come up, but you might have something else that you might want to do. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Glory to God.